Thank you for joining us today for our Hangout, a preliminary study using graphene to improve electrical contacts. Our host, Rod Martins, principal engineer at TE, is going to walk you through the properties of graphene and answer the questions, can we use graphene to improve the corrosion resistance and durability of, in electrical contacts? Rod, thanks so much for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you to get started. All right, thanks, Rachel. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to present this work that we've done in conjunction with Columbia University and Auburn University uh, that discusses the use of single layer CBD grown graphene to enhance the properties of electrical contacts. So with that, we'll pull up the presentation. And here we go. Okay, um, just a few preliminary comments on the preliminary study. Um, this is some very fundamental work we're working on. Um, it's, it's not going into a product, but it's, it's interesting, and we thought we'd share it with the technical community. Um, and I want to acknowledge my co-authors. This would be Professors Terrell, Kaiser, and Hone at Columbia University, uh, and Professor Jackson at Auburn University. A little bit of background here. Um, PE connectivity. Um, one of our core products, obviously, is electrical connectors. And uh, my work focuses on the electrical contact interface. So this would be basically where the rubber meets the road, where um, we conduct the uh, electricity at the interface. Um, one thing I, I guess I want to mention is that if you look at a connector and you know you look at your phone charger, you'll see a little glint of gold in there. Um, now, why would we use gold? I think gold is a fantastic material for, for what we want to do because it's uh, corrosion resistant, it's thermally conductive, it's electrically conductive. You add about half a percent of cobalt or nickel to it, and it's actually quite durable and low friction. So we don't use it because it's pretty. We use it because it really helps enhance the, the, the um, properties of an electrical contact. Of course, the problem here is that gold's expensive. And as engineers, we're trying to optimize cost at all, uh, you know, in any way that we can. So we're trying to get layers of gold uh, to uh, perform at the same uh, level. So as we get thinner and thinner in gold, one of the things that, two of the things we get concerned about would be uh, thin layers of gold don't completely cover a surface. They're somewhat porous and they can allow the substrate to be exposed to a corrosive environment. You get some uh, insulating films on the, on the surface and then you're having to replug your connector to make it work. Um, additionally, uh, the thinner that you go with the layers of gold, they're less durable, and that would make sense. You have less gold to wear through. Once again, then you expose the substrate, and you get some corrosion. So as we um, go thinner and thinner in gold to save cost, we're looking at ways that we can basically help the gold do its job, whether we're, we're adding lubricants on top of it, corrosion inhibitors, doing things underneath the gold, et cetera. And this is where the graphene comes in. Can we use graphene in some way to use less gold so that it does its job. Talk a little bit about graphene just fundamentally. Um, I guess I would argue graphene, carbon nanotubes, buckyballs, they're all still a bit on the upward swing of the hype curve. But um, if you've done any reading about the material whatsoever, I think you consistently hear that it's the strongest material that's ever measured. Uh, the modulus is up in the order of a, a terapascal, um, strengths of 130 gigapascals. Um, I've shown a couple of images here in the upper right, um, some work done by Lee and others where they etched holes in silicon, uh, transferred some graphene sheets over it, and then used a nano indenter to essentially uh, probe the suspended graphene to get some material properties out of it. So you can see they're, they're deflecting in the orders of nanometers and applying loads in the order of nano, nanonewtons to get these, these properties, so they're fantastic. Um, uh, mechanically at those those levels. It's electrically conductive. Uh, lots of people are looking at it for can we make transistors and other things out of it. Um, it's really beyond the scope of this talk. And then it's uh, chemically inert and gas impermeable. And from my perspective, that's what really kind of struck a chord with me is are these some properties that we could actually integrate into our products and make them better. So uh, just a little example on the, the right there with a penny that was half coated in graphene exposed to, to a corrosive environment, you can see that the, the upper half of the graphene is still shiny and then the bottom half is, it looks like a corroded oxidized copper penny. So um, 
we wanted to actually see if we could uh, grow this stuff on materials that, that we care about. So um, we did some sample fabrication at Columbia, and I'll walk through the graphene growth process just a little bit. Um, typically, the recipe uses pure copper, and then uh, the graphene is CVD or chemical vapor deposition uh, deposited at high temperatures. So you can see we're annealing the copper um, at 800 C for 10 hours, and then we introduce hydrogen at over 1,000 degrees, and then the carbon source is methane for 30 minutes at 1,000. What's interesting to me about graphene is, you know, you can use almost anything for carbons uh, as a carbon source. In fact, uh, I was just reading a paper the other day where they use Girl Scout cookies as the carbon source. So um, I don't know what MIT used, which particular brand, but anyway. Um, in the lower inset, you can see this is a strip of copper that we grew the graphene on. And, and I guess a logical question is, how do we know if we have graphene on the surface? And Raman spectroscopy is the typical method used there, where we examine um, certain peaks in the spectrum here. And we focus in on what's called the 2D peak. And so that on the lower right there, we've blown in on that. So if you have a relatively sharp peak around 2700, um, that would indicate monolayer graphene. Now, as we get multilayer graphene, what happens is that peak spreads out a little bit and it shifts to the right, to the point of you get a very broad peak um, much further to the right if you have graphite, which you know, graphite essentially is just multilayers of graphene. We took that trip, and this was just kind of our, our basically look-see to see if it's going to work, um, and then we etched it with oxygen plasma to remove the graphene on, on one piece, left the graphene in place on another, and then it did a nitric acid dip, which is basically going to really go after the copper. And you can see on the left with no graphene, we, we had significant uh, corrosive attack of the copper. Whereas on the graphene, um, if anything, we may have decorated the grains a little bit, but it's very clear, and very clean. So clearly the graphene is demonstrating some resistance to corrosive attack. All right, so it, it looks nice, but what I really care about is the electrical contact resistance. So um, if we have corrosion films on the surface, they're insulating, and we don't have good uh, low-level, reliable electrical contact. So um, using an, an instrument in my lab, um, we're actually probing these surfaces and measuring the contact resistance right at the interface. Um, we use a reference probe. So this was a six millimeter diameter brass ball with a micron and a half of nickel and five microns of soft gold. So that's a nice, clean, soft surface that we use as a reference probe. And then what we measured was the bare copper control, where we actually grew the graphene and then removed it with oxygen plasma, and the sample that still had the graphene in place, and then a control sample that has copper uh, with uh, a nickel underlayer and a three quarters of a micron of gold on it. So that would be a representative contact finish slide, we can uh, kind of see what, what happened here. So the blue uh, curve, which is a little bit higher in terms of contact resistance, is the uncoated copper. Uh, the red would be the graphene-coated copper, which is behaving somewhat similarly to our gold-coated coated, uh, control coupon. So this is very interesting. I guess I should note that um, the horizontal axis is increasing load. So we start at one gram, and then we load all the way out to 100 grams. Uh, and then monitor the resistance, you know, as it decreases. Um, once it's, we're at full load, the same curves, we introduced a little bit of wipe or translation at the, the uh, contact interface. Now, this would simulate when you plug or unplug a connector. Um, you're displacing some oxides, corrosion, whatever may um, be on the contact. And you can see in, in all cases, um, a little bit of wipe uh, helped quite a bit. In fact, the blue one, we, we were able to displace that oxide and, and get it down similar to the, the controls um, that are shown here with the red and the blue. I'm sorry, the red and the green. Well, interesting exercise, but I was a little bit concerned with our controls in that we, we grew the graphene and then we used oxygen plasma to remove it. So the question is, well, when we remove the graphene off the control, did we actually then subsequently oxidize it by the oxygen, oxygen, excuse me, oxygen plasma. 
So to create, um, I, would, I would call them pure controls, I want to be able to make sure that I have a known amount of copper oxide on the surface, which isn't necessarily as trivial as it might sound. Um, to understand how the, um, the oxide grows, we want to make sure that we're growing the right type of oxide. So this would be cuprous oxide that would happen at, at temperatures below 200 C or somewhat you know, relative to room temperature. And then um, we want to age it so that we generate that specific type of species. Um, and, and from this curve here, we can see that um, the relationship between uh, time and temperature and the film thickness. The point here was I want to be able to grow a known amount of oxide on a copper coupon. So I'll, I'll first of all, I'll clean it, and then I'm going to oxidize it to grow um, a, a film on there that, that's measurable. If it's too thick, then it's it's an open circuit. We can't measure it. We don't get any signal out of it. So um, I'll walk through this little exercise right here, which is more uh, fundamental contact physics in terms of Anytime we bring two surfaces together, it's a function of the constriction resistance, which was it is dominated by the geometry and the resistivity of the material, and the film resistance. So do we have an insulating film on top of it? So for a clean contact, we would neglect the second term. The constriction resistance is essentially the resistivity of the base material divided by the diameter of the area in contact. So we know the resistivity of copper, and we'll estimate the contact diameter by just calculating the Hertzian diameter. So that's fairly straightforward. Um, and that would be indicated by the black line over here on the curve. Now, once we start adding a film in there, once again, we have, then we have to consider the resistivity of the film, uh, the thickness of the film, as well as the area in contact. And that would be the rho times D over A. So we'll add that in series with the constriction resistance. And, and I plotted in a few different uh, film thicknesses corresponding to a few different growths and chose one that would give us uh, an order of magnitude or two above the uh, clean condition, but still well within our measurable range. Well, continuing that exercise um, is to verify a few things. If we start down here at the bottom, um, our calculated curves are down here for perfectly clean um, copper interfaces coming together. So the, um, the blue would be my calculation. The, the black dashed line down here is a reference from literature. You can see they agree pretty well. However, anytime you bring a surface, even if it's clean, you bring it out into the environment, you're going to have a few more layers of oxygen on it. And that essentially will also bump the curve up a little bit higher. So then the upper black dashed line is once again from the literature for monolayers of oxygen on um, virgin copper. Um, I took a uh, copper coupon and then we electro cleaned it. So basically we etched all the oxide off and got down to bare copper, but then it's exposed in the laboratory environment. And you can see we got very good agreement experimentally uh, with the dashed line there. So, okay, good. We have a good foundation to work from. Um, then I took one of those electro cleaned samples and then aged it um, for, at 100 C for two hours to try to get up to what our calculated red dash line was. We didn't quite hit it. It's a little bit off because the calculation assumes a perfect coverage of the film, no fracture, et cetera. So uh, it didn't quite reach the two orders of magnitude, but it's definitely a, bump, a bump in the signal. So we have something that we can measure. Now for the, uh, the proof of the pudding here, uh, now that we know how to have a good control, uh, we took some copper-coated coupons that were grown at Graphene Frontiers. This would be a uh, incubator company that came out of the University of Pennsylvania uh, in the Philadelphia area. Who um, I appreciate them growing some samples for us. So if we walk through um, the exercise once again, the blue curves are the copper. So the copper, before we electrocleaned it, this would be copper that had just been in the lab for a couple of years and has a normal oxide on it, was open circuit. We electroclean it, we make it clean, we bring it down to the lower blue curve here, and then we heat age it, and it comes back up to the uh, dashed blue line. So we know that, okay, that's where oxidized copper is gonna be. Now if we look at our graphene coated samples, uh, the solid, uh, line is the graphene as received and once again, it's it's Certainly lower than the open circuit open circuit copper, 
uh, but it's a few milliamps higher than than the uh, clean copper. But then we thoroughly age it that two hours at uh, 100 C, and you can see that the results are fairly similar. They're a little bit off here because I'm I'm plotting the median of nine uh, tests, so. Um, basically, we're not seeing a big impact of thermal aging here. It's again a preliminary study, but this is this is a, an initial data set. What's also interesting to note here is you can see these lines all drop down at 200 um, grams to fairly low value. This is where we introduced a little bit of wipe to all of these interfaces. What's interesting is once you add the wipe, which breaks through oxides, etc., they all come down to about the same value. Just a, a couple of interim conclusions then. Um, we've kind of demonstrated that single layer CBD graphene grown on copper um, can have some impact to copper oxidation and give us lower contact resistance values. But then really the open questions are, you know, I, I know this is the strongest material ever measured, but if you recall earlier, they were uh, testing in, in terms of nanonewtons, and our products use uh, loads certainly in the order of newtons. So we're um, many, many orders of magnitude off there. And then also, well, what are the fundamental corrosion initiation mechanisms in CBD graphene? Because at a certain point, I believe that we can actually corrode through it. So let's, let's look a little, a little deeper there. So uh, durability testing of monolayer graphene, this work was done uh, by Professor Terrell's group at Columbia, where they took a blunt Berkovich tip. So this would be in a nano indenter, where typically this radius would be in the order of nanometers, but for this exercise, it was blunted so that we can use it as a, a tribology tool. Uh, we're operating in loads of 10 micronewtons, and then the CBD graphene was grown on copper, but then it was transferred on to silicon oxide in the little uh, square area shown in the center there. Um, using the nano indenter, we were able to do some wear testing uh, of the graphene. And we went back to using Raman, so we would have a 20 micron wear track and then do Raman scans perpendicular to the wear track uh, at, at different areas. Um, and now we're going to look at a different portion of the peak, basically. So you see off to the right is the 2D peak where we know that we have monolayer graphene. But then by examining the ratio of the D to the G peaks, we can determine how defective the graphene is. So the thought is, as we're wearing on it, we're going to start tearing it or introducing defects into the graphene film. So we can use that as a, uh, as a metric for its durability. Well, in this slide, we're showing um, the 10 micronewton load at 10, 50, and 100 cycles. See that we're um, introducing more and more defects. So red would, would indicate that we've got a lot of defects in the film. Um, also, what's interesting is the frictional force is going up as a function of cycles. And this could be a couple of things going on here. Um, it could be that we're bunching um, the graphene up ahead of the um, of the tip, kind of like bunching a rug up. Um, and additionally, it could be that we're wearing a trough into the silicon as well, so we're getting a little bit more contact area, which would be higher force. Next exercise looked at the sliding velocity dependence on the durability of the graphene. And what was interesting here is that um, there is a very strong relationship with velocity, but the um, wear is worse at the lower um, velocities. And one hypothesis here is that at the slower velocity, there's longer residence time, so we can develop more adhesion between the tip and the graphene. Uh, but that, that work is ongoing, trying to figure out what's exactly going on there. And this would be more into the area of where Professor Jackson is looking at uh, doing some modeling. So we'll move away from kind of the mechanical interrogation of the film to the corrosion. So I. I to be honest, my uh, my concern with a lot of hype about graphene, carbon nanotubes, et cetera, is we project these wonderful from the nanoscale out to the macro scale. And typically, you can't achieve that. And the main reason for that is defectivity. Um, these beautiful hexagonal matrices of carbon atoms are grown um, on a large scale film, but however you examine them closer, these domains where the, the hexagonal hexagonal lattice is intact is usually on the order of tens of microns um, 
increasing up to a millimeter, but you could consider it as a grain. Essentially, at the edge of that, and rather than having you know six carbon atoms, you might have seven, and so it's a break in the in the structure, and then it reorganizes into a nice grain structure neighboring to that. But what you end up having is grain boundaries, and what we did here is we took a copper coupon that had a monolayer of graphene on it and then explode, expose it to a chlorine vapor for one, three, and five minutes. And what you can start to see is a decoration of these grain boundaries. So this would be imperfections in the graphene. So we know then that it's not perfectly impermeable because you can have corrosion that initiates those boundaries and then comes up and creeps over you know, the so-called good graphene and then you end up back where you started and you have a film covering the entire surface. Now, this is a case of, well, that's interesting. Can we uh, make lemonade out of the lemons here? So uh, previously, that was a corrosion response. What I'm showing here is a plating response. So we took a silver strike bath to see if we could initiate plating through the graphene. And similar to the, um, to the corrosion, we can initiate plating at the grain boundaries. So now what's interesting here is, I'm not convinced that graphene is durable enough to be on the top surface of an electrical contact. There's no way that it's going to be able to withstand the loads that we care about. However, can we exploit it by burying it and then plating on top of it? So now we have this basically an integral diffusion barrier built into the contact interface. So that's that's really where um, what we're looking at right now. So just a few quick conclusions here. Um, at a high level, we were shown we were able to show that the um, that it is somewhat gas impermeable. We we could limit oxidation and generate low contact resistance with the graphene. We found some indications with slower sliding speeds causing um, higher failures, and then also we we've shown where the corrosion and plating can initiate in the grain boundaries. So I want to uh, end here with some ongoing and future work. So our, our main focus going forward is going to be seeing if we can actually um, embed this impermeable graphene membrane in some of our, our plating structures and then uh, do some modeling to that effect. Once again, that's where Professor Jackson comes in. So we're going to be continuing this work. Actually, um, we did receive an NSF grant uh, for $400,000 split between Columbia and, and Auburn to continue this work. So. Um, I look forward to sharing more work and more results as it comes out as a, a function of this collaboration. Um, so with that, I guess I will turn it back to Rachel for any questions. Thanks, thanks, Rod. Um, yes, yeah, so this is the, the floor is open for any questions. Uh, and uh, I can go ahead and maybe get started with one that came in. Uh, the question really is around some of the barriers you see um, in, in um, using graphene to improve electrical contacts. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, sure. As I mentioned, this is really, really early work. Um, we don't have any plans to put this in a product. Uh, the biggest barriers for 